I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Welcome to the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone. Summer is officially underway, and with it comes all sorts of great competitive opportunities for juniors and college players alike, including the ITA Summer Circuit, all sorts of futures events on college campuses and different locales around the U.S. and around the world, and Also, the Saul Schwartz Save College Tennis All-In Tournaments being held in Atlanta and Baltimore again this year. Registration is open for the Saul, and I hope to see you at one or both of them. The Atlanta dates are July 21 and 22, and Baltimore is August 11 and 12. You can get more information by going to the Saul UTR on Facebook or, of course, Parenting Aces. Uh, we're posting on Facebook, tweeting out, uh, have all sorts of information on the tournaments on our various social media channels. So I hope you will visit and get your players signed up and join us. Those events are powered by UTR, as is a series of events that this week's guest will be discussing. And so I thought it was a great tie-in to have Barry Fulcher of the Progress Tour on the podcast to talk about a series of events that he has put together in the UK. And Barry is a former professional player. He is a current competitive player. He still loves to get out there and and fight hard to win matches. And he recognized that in the UK, they really needed to add some events on the calendar to allow players of a variety of levels to get out and hone their competitive skills. And so the Progress Tour was born, and Barry is going to give us all the details in this week's conversation. So I hope you enjoy that. You'll also hear Barry talk about a charity fundraising tennis event that he has organized. It's called, uh, it's called, sorry, the British Tennis Battles, the Big C. And for information on that, check out the show notes. We'll have a link to the webpage for that event and more information on how you can participate and or donate. So, I want to just remind you guys that, you know, we are driven by sharing and social media. And so we always appreciate it when you tweet out our podcast, our articles, when you share things on your social media channels and through your email list. Because tennis parents have got to stick together if we want to make a change. There's so many things going on in tennis around the world. Some good, some not so good. But if we all work together and speak out and fight for the changes that we know will benefit our sport and our children, then we can make a difference. And I think, you know, that is evident through all of the changes that we're seeing with UTR, with USTA, with the federations around the world, with the ITF now. And I think it's very important that we remember that we are one voice alone, but together we make a lot of noise and people listen. So please continue to share the podcast and, you know, download our episodes, uh, rate us on iTunes. All those things help get the word out and help us all do a better job. All right, I'll be quiet now and let you enjoy listening to the lovely accent of Mr. Barry Fulcher discussing the Progress Tour. Barry Fulcher, thank you so much for joining us on the Parenting Aces podcast. Thanks for having me on, Lisa. It's great to, sit, great to talk to you. Well, it's great to talk to you too. I always love having people with those lovely accents on the podcast. It's you know, not often that I get to do that. So it's a real treat. Thank you. <laughs> so let's start by having you give our listeners a little bit of your history in tennis. Okay. Well, uh, I've been 
a tennis lifer, I guess you'd call me. I started playing the age of four or five. My uh, bigger brother played, my mum and dad both played. So I was always down at the local tennis club, squash club, uh, with a racket in my hand. Uh, so it really kind of started from an early age and I got more and more into it. Uh, I was competing short tennis as it was back then before the days of mini tennis um, and went all the way through the, the LTA system as a junior competing. I was probably top 10 to 15 in the country, you know, 12, 12 years old upwards. So, uh, yes, I was, I was very much into it from a, from a early age, playing a lot, training a lot. Uh, I have it in my blood, I guess. And, um, yeah, it was, it was quite full on from probably age 12, 13 onwards. I was traveling, uh, around Europe, uh, and going on kind of international trips. Uh, but whilst also balancing my kind of, uh, my academic work as well. Um, and then kind of coming to the end of my, my schooling, I decided I wanted to uh, have a crack at going full time and playing professionally. Um, and did, did pretty well quite, quite, uh, quickly, I suppose, having had a, a wobbly few weeks, um, right off the bat. I, uh, I went off and got, picked up a couple of ATP points and uh, was soon kind of ranked, I guess, 900, 1000 ATP by the time I was, uh, 19. Um, I had a couple of options at that time, I, you know, before the days of emails and, uh, Back in those uh, those days of telephones and letters, that I'd come back home from travels, and I'd have uh, some letters from college coaches and offers from various coaches at Cal, um, Pepperdine, and my mother would say, "Hey, this is a great option. Why don't you go to America and go and study?" Um, but I had other other plans at that time, I guess. <laughs> Yes. Looking back, a bit of a uh, regret of mine, but, um, yeah, I kind of was on out there playing and, uh, applying my trade, trying to make my way in the, the world of professional tennis. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do that despite having a, quite a few offers to go to, uh, to go to a college in the States. I kind of carried on playing full time. Um, so yes, th- I did that until I was about 22, 23. Um, I found myself the same ranking at 22 as I was at uh, 19. So I reached a high of a 690, 700 ATP, um, a little bit higher in doubles, but I found myself treading water a little bit and uh, decided to stop playing. Um, as I said, kind of a regret uh, not going to college uh, and uh, kind of sticking at it, playing professionally, but not actually improving my game. My ranking was going up, but my game was not improving. So that had a shelf life and that's, that's kind of why I stopped when I did. So uh, I went straight to university then once I, uh, I stopped, I stopped, uh, playing professionally. I went to university in the UK, uh, still competed. I, I've always loved competing right from day one. Um, so I kept con- competing, made a few comebacks, got another ATP point a few years later. But largely since I was kind of 22, I've, I've been coaching. So that's a good 15, 16 years of uh, being a professional coach. And I've uh, done various courses, qualifications. Um, so I'm a career, career, and as I said, a career kind of, uh, lifer in terms of the game. So from a player as a kid to a professional and now a professional coach. So I still love to compete now. I'm a, a vet, as it were, over 35. <laughs> I'm, I'm captain of the GB uh, over 35 team and I try and play whenever possible. I've got that competitive uh, drive to get out on court and I love it. So uh, I try to do it as much as possible, practice what I preach. Um, so yes, that's my background. That's my history. And where are you based now? I'm in Brighton in uh, the UK. So it's about an hour south of London on the south coast. Uh gotcha. Yeah, I didn't. It's a beach town, yes. It is. It's lovely. It's kind of got the yeah. best best of everything. London's close, the seaside, the countryside, so it's a beautiful place for the for the kids. That's that's fantastic. And so recently, you have gotten involved in creating a playing and competing opportunity for 
juniors and others that want to participate, you started something called the Progress Tour. And I'd love for you to give us a little bit of background on that. What made you decide to create this tour and what it's all about? Okay, yeah. So last, uh, I guess a, a bit of frustration on my part to uh, building over a couple of years. I coach a group of uh, players, either college level players or uh, I suppose similar level players to I was, low level pros, 700, 800, 900 ATP. Um, Julian Cash, who's uh, just graduated from OSU in the States, I coach him. Um, and I felt that there was not enough opportunities in terms of ranking events in the UK. Uh, there was actually six last year, six this year, um, six the year before in terms of futures. Um, and looking back to when I played, there was, you know, up to 17, 18, 19, and actually 20 plus in some cases, futures every year. Uh, equally, the prize money side of things uh, in the UK, that the budget of the British tour, which is where I earned my uh, crust, if you like, I earned enough money to try and fund my travel back 15, 20 years ago when I played. Uh, it suffered such huge cuts that it, it suddenly didn't serve the purpose of a, a prize money tour. It was more a a junior developmental tool for the large part. So there was uh, a couple of larger prize money events, but there's a big void. So we have professional or aspiring professional players that can't play ranking events in the UK, and they can equally not earn enough money to travel to play ranking points. Um, and that I've seen that cycle kind of continue. Um, it's kind of perpetuated. So we lose a generation of players. They, you know, they reach the age of 23, 24. They can't afford to keep playing. They can't access ranking tournaments to push their ranking up. And we lose generations. We've just lost one. I would suggest probably seven or eight guys around two to 380 P. Um, that it kind of had to stop. And that I think that is a terrible shame when you think of, uh, you know, the potential of that level of player. And I think we need to look after that level of player more. So the background for uh, the progress tour, I guess, was uh, I started last summer, this, this kind of time. I thought I'm going to run a prize money event. The prize money event I set up, it was in Brighton last summer. Um, I decided I was going to primarily put a prize money event on for that level of player. So I managed to scrape around, put some money together. I had uh, some contacts that I asked to sponsor the event. Um, I put, I suppose I kind of advertised the prize money first uh, and didn't quite get that amount in sponsorship, but uh, so I managed to cover the rest of it out of my pocket. But I was so pleased. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. Don't you love when tennis continues to cost money? <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I kind of knew it might, I, I put it together in a very short space of time. So I talked about it, thought about it, and I just thought I'm going to go for it. Otherwise, I'll never do it. Um, and it was a fantastic event. Um, I, the UTR side of it, the universal tennis rating, I kind of, I had this idea of the top end and how I wanted to, to provide earning opportunities for um, almost everyone in the in the uh, main draw. I think 12 out of 16 players that competed in the main draw made profit. And that was one of my things was, is to try and give players the opportunity to earn. Uh, each player in the main draw was offered housing, which I think is quite a common place over in the States, but it's not, it hasn't been uh, the case here. Uh, and that was one of my drivers. It used to be commonplace here. Not oh, yeah? so much anymore. Yeah. Not so much anymore. Yeah, so the, the the that was kind of clear from the start for me, and then the I wanted to be able to open it up to all levels of player. So the UTR, I, I kind of looked into it and thought, yeah, like that, that that fits together. It's a way of uh, structuring um, the tournament, and I got in touch with uh, Randy Jenks of the UTR, and we talked about how the event might look and how we could structure it. Um, and I soon kind of got a picture of how the UTR works. It, you know, a lot of it for me was uh, engaging with my local clients here in Brighton, local juniors and saying, look, this is, yes, it's a £6,000 prize money event, but it, equally it's open to players of all levels. Um, and I managed to fill the draw. We had 64 players in the end. 
Um, and that, you know, ranging from 11 years old through to 71 years old. Uh, wow. and th- it was fantastic to see it. You know, the, the cross age, cross gender element that the UTR offers, I think, uh, is fantastic. Um, and by chance, the very first match on the first day, so we had five draws. The first match in uh, draw five was that 11 year old girl taking on the 71 year old man. Uh, and they had a humdinger of a match won by the 11 year old girl, 12 10 in the championship tie break, which just epitomized kind of what UTR represents. Um, so that, that was the kind of start point in terms of my, uh, my understanding of the UTR and what it can bring. And I was unsure of some of the elements of it, the cross gender thing, particularly. Um, but I went with it and I have not looked back since. I think it's fantastic. I think it's uh, a great developmental tool on both sides of the coin. Um, and that kind of propelled me on into, uh, wanting to do more. The progress tour, I guess, uh, from conversations with a, a, a lady, you know, Sarah Borwell, a tennis smart college placement company. She's, uh, very proactive on your side of the pond and ours in terms of getting getting our athletes from here into uh, great university places over in America. Um, and it was through conversations with her of, you know, where we're missing things, what's not there. Um, so we talked about the potential of a, a tour. So I kind of uh, took that idea and started piecing it together. I talked to Sarah and, you know, I came up with a couple of different names and the progress tour kind of came up. Uh, cause I feel like it is an area we need to progress and offer that progressive element of that the UTR offers, but also progress the way we look at tennis in this country. Um, well, and the w- world over for that matter is to look at things a little bit differently is to engage and, uh, you know, include people that might not otherwise be engaged. So part of the uh, tour is to try to, you know, it, it, it's focused largely to begin with on those aspiring juniors uh, and those pro players that are looking to get matches and earn money. But equally, I'm trying to reach out to those adult club players that still love to compete. Why can't they compete against a a good junior? Um, And I'm trying to push that at each event, trying to engage local players that there just aren't many um, competitive opportunities for, for players of that level. So yes, the, the the kind of ethos behind the progress tour uh, developed. I I spent many 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 sleepless nights putting it together and uh, picturing it in my head, and I came up with a kind of tagline of compete, learn, earn, uh, and that's kind of stayed with the the tour right from day one. That the idea that I want to offer great competitive opportunities, a guaranteed competitive. Um, matches, level based matches, progressive opportunities for every player, whether they are winning the event or whether they are losing all three of those matches, that they're, they're getting good quality level based matches. So, uh, it, it, you know, it's taken some learning on my part and adjusting of draws. We started with round robins and I've adjusted that as we go. Um, and that's why I love the UTR because I think it offers flexibility that other systems do not. So I've been able to adapt things as I go and uh, the feedback from players has been great. Uh, the, the second part, I mentioned the learn element. I, I, having grown up, as I said, through the system, a lifer, I think now more than ever, there is so little in the way of uh, advice and guidance given to coaches, players, parents. Um, and, you know, the amount of parents I talk to that they are lost. They don't know where to focus. We have a, a very broken ratings and ranking system in the UK. Um, that's kind of been talked about a lot. I know on Sarah's uh, Facebook page of, of late, um, it's broken. It's been broken for a while. And talking to these parents, they are at a loss as to where to focus. And in my view, they shouldn't have to choose where to focus. So uh, the UTR, I think, is, a, is fantastic, as I've said. Um, the learn element was to give players, to give parents opportunities to, to learn while they're competing. Why not? Why should it just be you play your matches and you go home? So I've sought out, uh, friends, contacts, uh, experts that I, I've kind of got in to do workshops. Um, the last event, for example, we had, uh, Sally Anderson who came and talked to uh, some of the aspiring college athletes about how to sell themselves in personal statements and how to, 
you know, to really highlight their strengths when they when they're filling in their their application forms to both American universities and to British universities, uh, as well as a sports psychologist. We had uh, Dan Kin, who's a former British double number one player, a graduate from LSU, um, just talking about his his kind of journey through the game. And the feedback from that has been fantastic. You know, the, the, the players and parents just bowled over by the fact that actually you can come to a tournament and you can come away having been educated and, and kind of shone a light on a different area that you, they might not otherwise know about. So that, that was really important from the, from the off. Um, and the last element, earn, compete, learn, earn is the obvious one is to earn enough prize money to try and make it work it's not a huge amount of money i'm uh, i'm self-funding it and uh, you know without a sponsor for all the events it's it's modest prize money but it, i've tried to make up for that fact and offer as well as the chance to earn prize money the chance to earn really good developmental opportunities so uh, one of our junior bonus winners uh, from the brighton event won a trip to a, t- a tennis uh, academy in Tenerife the Tenerife Tennis Academy for a week's all-inclusive training um, and we've got the same kind of junior bonus on offer for the forthcoming event at Sutton where the, the winner will win a, a week training at the Soto Academy in uh, Spain with Dan Kiernan so I've been keen to not o- only offer earning opportunities in terms of finance but also a uh, great chance to uh, get out on the court with some experts, with some different people. So our, our junior players are developing all the time. And the support for that has been great. You know, I've, I've got Louis Kaye, who's the world-renowned doubles coach, who's agreed to do a workshop for my eight kind of uh, event winners at the end of the year. So a kind of two-hour masterclass with him. I've got Nigel Sears, uh, who's a WTA coach, also offered a a session for the female bonus winner of the masters event. So it's been a, a real journey for me um, and kind of getting through the pitfalls, the ups and downs, filling events, and spreading the word. It's, it's a very full on, but I have loved every minute of it and love the learning process involved in it myself. Well, it sounds incredible. And one of the things I, I want to just give you a chance to address, because I know this question is popping up in the heads of the parents of college bound junior players is this whole notion of prize money and NCAA eligibility. Yeah. Well, that, that's something Sarah, uh, we, we talked about that a fair bit at the start. Um, and I, I am not that clued up on the NCAA rules in terms of that. Um, <laughs> well, it's okay because they change every five minutes yes. anyway. So. <laughs> I know uh, I know a few friends of mine that have been college coaches and they have said it's pretty extensive, but uh, you need to be on it, keeping up with it. But uh, I, I, I believe uh, the prize money, uh, and that's kind of one of the reasons why the, the developmental side of it, the earning potential of, external uh, non-financial uh, earning opportunities was, has been pushed more so than the uh, financial side of it. I, be, I believe to earn, you know, with the vast costs involved in traveling to tournaments also to have an, a prize money that might cover those costs is okay. Um, yes. I know there's still some gray area and I've been approached by some, some uh, parents here that are questioning that same thing. Um, but I direct them to Sarah. That's the safest way. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a very good source of information and, um, we'll include her contact information in the show notes as well. Yeah. Um, she and I did a podcast together a few months ago. So my audience is, or hopefully is familiar with Sarah and the great stuff she's doing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, this whole idea of developing a series of tournaments is something that has appealed to me. I, I run two tournaments here in the, in the States. Um, they're similar events to what you're doing in terms of we use UTR and, and everything is based on UTR. We form our draws based on UTR. They are, you know, men are playing women, boys are playing girls, 12 year olds are playing, you know, yeah. college players. Um, in this, in our event is, is just open to juniors and collegiate players. But, um, 
you know, this idea of, of really developing a full tour to give people the opportunity to compete at a level that, like you said, is, hasn't been available in the UK. And there are many parts of the States where that competitive opportunity isn't available as well. Um, I just, I love that, that whole concept, uh, the learning side of it. I I'm curious, you know, what are your plans in terms of education? Because this is another piece and you're absolutely right about, especially the parents. And that's the side I come from wanting and needing information on how to help their kids reach their full potential in tennis the information is just not there. And I mean, yeah, you know, frankly, that's why parenting aces exist. So. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, yeah. And, and I didn't quite, I suppose I had it in mind and that, that kind of byline, if you came, if you like came up, the compete, learn, earn, but having seen it in action. And, and like I said, even with the UTR, having seen it in action and the more I see it, the more I realize just how needed it is. It's, it's not difficult to do if I can do it by, reaching out to contacts and finding a way to get, you know, a sports psychologist down for an hour and to, you know, to deliver a workshop, it's, it's doable. And I don't have the resources that uh, others have. So why, why can't we do it? Why can't we be constantly feeding back to our parents? Cause I know it's a, uh, it's, it's a minefield out there and there are so many different routes that you could go. Uh, and I just think it, it, the, the parents and kids are largely left to their own devices come 16, 17. And that's why someone like Sarah is very busy because they don't know where else to turn. So it's America, British University. Do I play pro? You know, it's, it's, we should be constantly giving options. Um, and that's, uh, you know, like I said, I, I've seen it and witnessed it and the feedback has been great. And I'm looking to introduce more and more of those workshops so that the, the event we've got coming up, which is the biggest one of the year so far, is the Tennis Smart Showcase event at Sutton. Um, so we've got some exciting workshop planned there with uh, with Matt Little, who's um, Andy Murray's fitness trainer, uh, strength and conditioning coach. Um, Ed Corrie, who's a current pro. Uh, he's British number seven uh, at the moment, and he's... In town for Wimbledon, he, he's a US graduate as well. Um, so he's going to talk about his journey. Uh, and also Dan Kean and again, uh, talking from Soto to a, a larger audience this time. So, uh, you know, I'm looking to add new workshops, new expertise. So, so parents are really getting a broad spectrum of advice and guidance. Yeah, it's wonderful. So how many days are your events or do they differ? They, the progress tour, they are four days. Um, generally, uh, that they've, some of them have been spread over, over two weekends where we've gone, you know, two day qualifying and then a two and a half day main draw. Um, but again, I, the, funnily enough, one of the events was we had a snowed off, uh, qualifying event in Millfield, which is the second event we, we had. Uh, so the whole qualifying event, I was en route there and the school decided it was just too dangerous to go ahead with the qualifying. So I put regrettably put the note out there that we had to uh, cancel. And I said, look, let me know if you're keen to come back next weekend. And uh, out of the 24 players, I think that were due, we only had four players that didn't want to come back. So I managed to squeeze a qualifying and a main draw into three very, very full days in Millfield. Um, and like I said before, the, the beauty of the UTR is that I could be versatile with the scoring. I shortened the format a little bit and we managed to get through a first day of 15 and a half hours of matches. Um, and we got through the full schedule where everybody got their guaranteed matches and it was a great event. So that was a three day on uh, three courts and it was pretty hectic, but, uh, yeah, generally we, we're, I'm kind of trying to do it in four days and the same with the Sutton event that's coming up. That's going to be four very full on days. So it's, it, it starts with a qualifying, uh, which is again adapted a little bit with each event. It's, it's a staggered entry draw. So depending on the player's UTR level, they will start further in the draw. Um, if players lose, they drop into a, a little play out box. So they, they get more matches of, of players that have, of the same level that has similarly dropped out of the main draw. 
And if they are winning, they're progressing forward to play uh, tougher and tougher competition. So I've, I've tailored that, I guess, as we've gone on. I really like that big open draw staggered entry system. Yeah, I think that's uh, a system that's starting to be looked at more and more by tournament directors, and it makes so much sense. Um, Tennis Europe's used that system for a while now, and, you know, why would you want to go to a tournament and win your first two or three matches 0-0? I mean, what does that do for your development, really? Yeah, absolutely, and that... that uh... You know, you, you're always going to get those matches that are one-sided, and um, but yes, if we can limit that, and if we can give, whether it's the lowest UTR level or the highest UTR level, if we can give them better matches from the start, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's a system going back to when I was a kid many years ago. We had a, a system that was just like that in this country, and we had a system that worked, and we just moved away from that. So it's, it's great to kind of revisit something that was quite familiar to me 30 odd years ago. You mentioned using a shortened scoring format. I'm curious, A, which format you chose and B, what was the reaction or feedback from the players? Um, it was, uh, so the, the format I've used for the progress tour generally is two full sets um, with a championship tiebreak decider if needed. Um, and I really like that format. I, I use that for the prize money event and it's, it's long enough to be really competitive and letting, uh, the players really get stuck into the proper ups and downs of a match. Um, but not going into kind of three and a half, mar- three and a half hour marathons of, you know, seven, six in the third set and, uh, real marathons, particularly as we're talking about uh, trying to get a volume of matches. Um, and I, I'm not keen to go shorter than that. But like I said, there's been, I suppose, that one occasion where actually for players to play three matches in a day, they just couldn't play that format. And I had to get through a certain draw in a day. So I sent out an email and said, look, we're going to go to uh, short sets, meaning first to four. Um, so I... It was tie break at three all. Uh, we didn't play. There's something called the fast four rules over here that, uh, I am really not a fan of, which is you, you play the lets, the serving lets, you carry on as normal. You play sudden death juice. The tie breaks first to five. And I think that is, it's a, it's a ticking a box to get as many matches done as possible. So I tried to avoid going down that route too much. So I kept it normal tie breaks. Um, just a tie break at three all first to seven. Um, so two sets first to four and then a, a championship tie break decider if needed. So that way we managed to get through the, you know, the three rounds of qualifying in about nine or 10 hours. Um, and, and were the players okay with that? They were. Yeah. I think for, you know, for the reason that they had, lots of them had started their journey to the, to the event the weekend before and explained that. That, that it was just for qualifying we were doing that. And once we got through qualifying, we shifted back to my preferred format. Uh, and they were understanding. I think uh, in reality, they, the, the British kids are very used to uh, playing those fast four rules. And the fact that I didn't include the, the let rule, they were relieved about more than anything. <laughs> Well, they have to learn it when they come over here to play college tennis. So. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the no ad and the lets and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just felt, well, that, that as well as the, the, the kind of short tie, but everything was short, short, short. And yeah, there's only so much you need to shorten it. I think I, I know there's logic behind the let rule in, in I've heard stories of how that rule came about, but I want to, I, I like the ups and downs of a match and I don't want to detract from that too much. You know, I like the momentum shifts that you get in longer, longer kind of ties, if you like. I'm with you. I am not a fan of the no ad scoring. The lets, playing the lets, I get, um, that doesn't bother me nearly as much, but, um, I, I seem to be in the minority. So, um, <laughs> I'm glad to have an ally in you, Bear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll fight the cause. Yeah, exactly. So what are you seeing as a result of the progress tour? Are you seeing more kids maybe consider playing college tennis that hadn't thought of it as an option because of the education you're providing, because of 
you know, their exposure to playing against these older players? Uh, I think, I, you know what, I, the word is still spreading and I'm, there's new players coming to the events all the time. This, this coming event, we're up above 55 entrants and lots of new ones. Um, I've had a real mix of, I think people are starting to be aware of the import, importance of UTR um, in terms of the journey to America and how much more uh, respected that is than our domestic rating system. Um, and in some cases, I think the ITF uh, ranking even, the UTR seems to be the most accurate um, indicator of level. So, it, yeah, I think it, the, the, there's a couple of things that add up. People are, are tired of our system, so it's refreshing to actually for them to go and play and get stuck into matches. And I really encourage, I think any rating system should happen in the background rather than be the competition itself. And I've, you know, I've had feedback saying it's a much more healthy environment for the players to compete in because it's not about protecting I, I you know, I've got X amount of wins, therefore I won't compete or that person is that level, therefore I will avoid it. Um, and it, it's, you know, the, the last event, one of the players that came over from Team Soto, he played six matches in three days. And, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to give more matches where possible if there's court space. And, you know, as the beauty of the UTR is that if there's two players of the same level. I'll say, you know, go for it. And I can record right. that those scores and put them through. And, and you don't get that at other events, I don't think. So, um People are starting to, you know, like I said, I, I haven't got a database, so I am constantly on the social media as, as green as I am with it and as uh, naive as I am to it. I'm trying to use that to get word out to players. And, and I think more and more players that are coming back from America, obviously, uh, you know, UTR is the way forward. It's everything over there and that filters back to the junior players here. So it's starting to, to have a bit of a snowball effect, I guess. That's so interesting that you say that. And, you know, it's, I mean, UTR took a long time to kind of grab hold here. Um, and there's still plenty of people that have some trepidation over it and, you know, really don't understand how it works and, you know, aren't so sure it's the right way forward. Um, I'm a firm believer in, in the core system of UTR and, and level-based play and, you know, intergender play, I think is all of that is only going to help players get better. The more diverse your opponents uh, in terms of age and style and gender and all of that, I mean, you learn something every time you go on the court with someone, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, interestingly seeing the girls uh, that have taken to it quite quickly that I mean the improvements even over the course of one event uh, one of the girls that won the Millfield event she's a young 16 year old and she's ranked three in the country in the UK and top 200 ITS so she's one of our top juniors and she she took to it like a duck to water she had a, a great tournament she beat a uh, a lad two years older than her uh, ranked 12 in the country in the UK. So, uh, you know, a lad that wins a lot and they had a fantastic match. She, she saved four match points in her first match and then came through that one against uh, this older chap. And, you know, as her mum said, if she, imagine if she did this for the next two years, how much better she's going to be. She's going to be better at dealing with that kind of serve, that heavier spin that, that other girls might not offer. And, you know, that it's so refreshing to hear a parent actually look at it from that perspective. Um, what did the parent of the boy say that she beat? <laughs> um, I, d I didn't see them. Um, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, there's different challenges. I think the, the boys, you know, going back to the, the first event I did last summer, we had uh, two girls who were two female players who were WTA four to 500. Um, and they were in the, preliminary draw so we had a utr cutoff of 13 for the top draw and a very strong uh, you know tier two so the two girls were in that tier two and i know literally none of the players had ever or since the days of mini tennis had ever competed cross gender and uh it was roger draper's son ben draper um 
you know, first match on court against uh, a Ukrainian girl, Mar- Marsha Zarkaluk, who's about 400 WTA. She, they, you know, they had a really, really tight first few. That, that was that format was a, a pro set, and they had a really tight opening six, seven games. Um, and he said, I couldn't, you know, he came off court. He said, I couldn't, couldn't play early on. I was so nervous. Um, and it's a different type of pressure. And, you know, he came through it. Was, he won it eight, four, I think in the end in the pro set, but it, it was a different type of pressure for him. Likewise, she came off and absolutely loved it. The different, you know, dealing with this 120 mile an hour serve and it, it just opens up so many different elements that, that we don't otherwise see. And some people don't get it. Some people, you know, that's that's not real. That's not tennis as we know it. And turn the other way, and that's fine. But the more, like I said, the more I've seen it in action, the more I think it's just why not? Why why are we missing out on so many competitive opportunities? Particularly, I think um, from a female perspective, here there's some events that just don't go ahead because there aren't enough female players. And why do we just stick with female only events? Let's mix it and give the girls a chance to play that want to play. Right. Oh, I totally agree. And I think, you know, it's going to be interesting uh, to see how this progresses, uh, how the progress tour progresses. That was really weird. Um, <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> but, you know, one of the conversations that happens all the time here in the States is this whole idea of, you know, winning at a young age and having, you know, a top ranking at a young age and, you know, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset and, and how do we help our kids develop to their fullest potential? What is it that we should be doing to help them reach their highest level? And to me, events like what you're offering are the pathway to that for, for many people. Not, and, and again, tennis, I think this is one of the things that makes our sport so confounding is there there's no one path for everyone right yes absolutely yeah and, and yeah i think it's uh same with anything some people will go like that and some people will turn the other way um but for the large part people you know funnily enough at, at uh the event the last event i had a uh, girl come to play and she had a very tough first matchup. The UTRs were close, but it, uh, it, it happened to be quite a, a one-sided, uh, match that she lost to a, a male player. And, you know, that, that I was speaking to the, the her parent afterwards who's just, that's, this is not what we signed up for. This isn't, you know, we, we didn't realize it was going to be this. That's not a matchup. It wasn't close at all. And I said, look, it's, I, you know, appreciate it's different and, Give it another chance. She's got two more matches. And, uh, sometimes, you know, same, same that you might have two girls that they have a similar UTR level and it might be a six, two, six, one. These things happen. But I said, just, just we can chat tomorrow and, you know, we can talk about the future events that you're, you're entered into. Um, and if you're not happy, of course, you can, you can pull out and we'll go our separate ways. But as the tournament progressed, the, this, uh, girl who, had struggled in her first match, had an absolutely fantastic second match up against another boy and came through it in the champ- championship tie break. And like I said, it's a bit of a shock factor, I think, because, because people aren't and players and parents aren't used to it. And talking to the same parent, uh, you know, on the third day of the event, she had a very different perspective on it. And the first match was a tough one. Yes. But, uh, the, the other two matches were fantastic and she was coming around to the idea of, that actually this could be positive and there, there, there is a route forward kind of cross gender and cross age element. So it's, mm-hmm. it's people's opinions shift, they change. And like I said, some people will veer towards it and some people won't, but I, I love it and I'm going to continue doing it. Well, that's good to hear. And I, I mean, I will say too, that a lot of times we parents, may have an opinion of something that doesn't necessarily jibe with our child's opinion. And I think as a tournament director, you know, oftentimes you're going to hear from the parent, not the child. And sometimes if we parents can take a breath and actually talk to our child and get their input on their experience, maybe that will help us have a better understanding. And I know I was guilty of that when my son was coming up, you know, I don't, I think it's, 
it's very easy for us as parents to say, wait, this isn't good for my child. But in reality, your child understands that it's good for them and is actually enjoying the process. Yes, agreed. I absolutely agree. Yeah, I think, uh, but uh, again, the systems that we've created, I think there is such a, a like I said, the pressure on win loss ratio and ratings that, uh, that, that often is the, the driver. It has to be the driver, unfortunately, behind that, that thinking of the parent and that often relates back to the child's thought process. Uh, it's something I've said all along that, that the cut, the, the system has created the culture of, chasing ratings, chasing rankings, being obsessed with a number by your name, and that won't change overnight. We can change the the structure, if you like, the, the system, the bring the UTR in, but it, it will take a while to shift culturally for people to go, actually, that number can happen in the background, and my UTR will do what it needs to do. But I can focus on the, the competing and the getting out on the court and getting good matches under my belt. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm thrilled to learn more about the progress tour and to share it with the parenting aces audience. So thank you for, for talking about it. I want to also make sure that we take some time to chat about something a little more, uh, a little closer to your heart, maybe. Um, and that's a charity tennis event that you're running in the uk and i would love for you to talk a little bit about that as well yes well um i'm running the the second annual uh prize money event that i i mentioned to you earlier it's the the tournament i started with last year i'm running a repeat of it this year Um, and it will be the biggest winner's prize money uh in british domestic british tennis so it's a two and a half thousand winner's prize um so i'm holding that at my my uh own club down here in Brighton again. Um, so I'm excited to, to kind of go into that, having got a bit more experience under my belt and uh, get another good event on the go. So part part of that, as you mentioned, is uh, something a bit more personal to me. It's something I've thought about doing for some years now. Um, just approaching last week and kind of this time 10 years ago, I Shortly after getting married, about three weeks after getting married, I found out I had uh, a tumor and uh, had to have a surgery to remove the tumor. Um, I then went through three, four months of chemotherapy um, to treat the cancer that had uh, started to spread through my body. Um, I was very fortunate. I, I think my chances and my prognosis was always very good. And I knew that from uh, the outset, really, that it had been caught relatively early. Uh, and there's no doubt it was a dark time for me. Um, it tested uh, tested me a lot, put a lot of things into perspective for me. Um, I went through stages of feeling sorry for myself. And, it's, uh, yeah, I, I went on a bit of a journey. And uh, not just with the illness itself, but the the recovery afterwards, getting back to normal life. I happened to wake up from that surgery unrelated with a, a paralyzed shoulder, my beloved tennis playing shoulder at that. Uh, so wow. I couldn't lift my arm up for the best part of nine months. And they basically told me I'd never be able to play tennis again, um, which at the time going through chemotherapy was the least of my worries. Um, but it, yeah, it was a journey. And I, I look back at that time and I find it quite a humbling humbling time really um and i i look back and think actually i was very lucky i met a lot of people that deal with uh that illness uh 10 times worse um terminal cases you know met a lot of brave people that were staring death in the face um a lot of care workers nurses doctors that uh, i have the utmost admiration for um and it humbled me. I, I soon got over that feeling of self pity and realized actually I am one of the lucky ones. And it's, uh, it's something I wanted to, I suppose, celebrate and mark 10 years down the line that I was one of the lucky ones. So part of the tournament this year, I'm running a, a charity fundraiser raising, um, funds for the Sussex Cancer Fund who looked after my treatment here in Brighton at the Royal Sussex Hospital and also the Cancer Research UK. 
So uh, we're looking at making a, it's part of that, the, the prize money event. It's a, a Davis Cup doubles fest, if you like. So I've uh, reached out to all my contacts in British tennis and uh, it's billed as British tennis versus the big C. So I'm, I'm trying to engage with a lot of the, uh, you know, current and former pros, um, some high profile names that you might recognize to be released really soon. Um, but basically everybody I've reached out to has been hugely supportive and offered, uh, their presence at the event. They've offered, uh, you know, amazing donating prizes to the charity auction that we're hosting. Um, so I'm aiming to raise 20,000 pounds for those two charities for that, that evening. Um, and I'm determined to, to smash that target just to be able to give something back and mark a, a personal kind of time for me, but really try and raise some serious money for those two amazing causes. Um, so I'm excited to do that. That's fantastic, Barry. Congratulations on your good bill of health. And, um, I wish you all the success with these, with this event. I think it's going to be fantastic. And so my listeners know we'll have the link to, to that event, to Barry's fundraising webpage and also to the progress tour. So you can read a little bit more about that and. Hey, listen, if anybody listening is interested in starting something similar here in the States, I would wager that Barry would be more than happy to consult with you and help you pick something off. Yes, I've, as I said earlier, I've learned, learned the hard way. There's pitfalls and the ups and downs, but uh, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to planning kind of what's, what's coming next in 2019, looking to grow the tour. Um, develop it and try and offer more earning opportunities, more competitive opportunities and really pushing home that, that same message, creating a tour that, that can really put, put its kind of place on the, the British tennis calendar, if you like, going into next year. So I'd be happy to talk to anyone. There's, there's a few inquiries I've had from far flung places, but uh, you know, that's fantastic. The more, the more we can get UTR out there and get different and better opportunities competitive opportunities out there to players the better absolutely well thank you so much and it's been a total pleasure speaking with you and i wish you all the best with your upcoming events and i hope you will continue to stay in touch and maybe we can do this again in a year and hear about the new and fantastic additions that are coming to the progress tour definitely lisa thanks so much for talking to me and it's been great great to talk ucr and talk the progress tour Fantastic. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll catch you next time on Parenting Aces. I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at ParentingAces.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.